Good morning and happy Sabbath. You know, I prepare for Sabbath school during the week, you know, I, you know, and I get stuff on my computer and I print it out, I put it in my lovely binder and I recognize that, yeah, I forgot to print this week's. So this is going to be an interesting day, but that's okay, that's okay. Sometimes ad-libbing's the, the best way to go, but we are back for another week of In the Crucible with Christ. Looking forward to that. Let's go ahead and say a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this wonderful Sabbath day, day that we can come, worship you, and Lord, we just ask that as we open your word, help us to gain a blessing of what you do in our lives, better understanding of that, how you work in our lives to win us back to you in relationships of love and trust. In your name we pray, amen. So as we open this week, Sabbath lesson, seeing the goldsmith's face. The memory text, but we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the spirit of the Lord, 2 Corinthians 3.18. Amy Carmichael took a group of children to a traditional goldsmith in India. In the middle of the charcoal fire was, the car, was a curved roof tile. On the tile was a mixture of salt, tamarind fruit, and brick dust. Embedded in this mixture was gold. As the fire devoured the mixture, the gold became purer. The goldsmith took the gold out of, of, with tongs and, if it was not pure enough, he replaced it in the fire with new mixture. But each time the gold was replaced, the heat was increased. The group asked, how do you know when the gold is purified? He replied, when I can see my face in it. God is seeking to purify us, to refine us like gold, to transform us into his image. That's an astonishing goal. And it seems even more astonished that a Christ-like character is developed in us only as we pass through life's crucibles. I love, the, I love the question this week at a glance. What role does suffering have in the purifying process? And how do we understand all this in the context of the great controversy? I love that, I love that question, that two-part question. How do we understand this in light of the great controversy? Controversy. Isn't that the question? Isn't that the big question? When you read the Bible, you can come away with a lot of different interpretations. You can come away with some confusion. You can come away with a lot of knowledge, regardless. But when you see things through the great controversy view, wow, things start making more sense. Amen? Okay? Love that. So as we were reading there, what do you make of that? I, I love that lesson, or I love that particular story there, the refiner's fire. How, what do you make of that? Good morning. Any ideas? Oh, don't be shy. Okay, no? You, okay, yeah, Andy. Oh, we should have the, oh, you got, the, there we go. Oh, I'm good. Get there. Um, <clears throat> The refiner's fire is Jesus. Jesus is the one that's... However, he's not just the one, you know, saying, you take this, you take this. No. And uh, he, he is the one that went through it already. So this is not nothing new for him. He's, he's allowing us to go through this, this, the refiner's fire. And so, uh, and, and uh, what's unusual about this is that we, we really can't get a hold of this. Uh, take, for instance, you know, these gold coins that are available in the world. Yeah. The, the, e uh, the U.S. Eagle, the, uh, um, the Canadian Maple Leaf, the South African Cougarand, those are 0.9999% pure. Right. That is not good enough. Right. In, in God's world, it's 100%. And so, so we need to go through that refiner's fire even more pure than man can even, uh, even understand. Right. Right. Absolutely. And I love what you said there. I love what you said there. And we can't do it on our own. We have to do it with 
No, we can't. We, you know, and nine 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 and think, you know, I'm almost perfect, but we will never be perfect without Jesus. Right, we will never be perfect without Jesus. Absolutely. Hold on, Glennis. We're working on batteries here. We'll get right to you. You know. Okay, go ahead. Absolutely. Jesus is the goldsmith. See, I, oh, I love this. See, too often we want to limit, well, Jesus has to be the goldsmith. No offense. Okay. And, and but you said Jesus is the refining fire, but yet we also know there's, there's fire trials that we go through. It's like, well, let's not nitpick this to death and lose the overall picture. Amen. We know. Okay. I love what Troy said too, because... We cannot go through this fire without Jesus. Amen? My mind immediately thought of, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire furnace. That's where my mind immediately went. They could only make it through that fire because Christ was with them. Amen? Okay. Now, we're talking different kinds of fire here. Okay. Let me be very clear. We're talking different kinds of fire. Andy, love what you said there. I'm depending on you to speak up sooner or later. <laughs> just, just know that. Okay? We know that Christ is the refining fire. I love what you said there. Remember the burning bush. Moses. What did he hear? Take off your shoes for the, for the ground you stand on is holy, right? Wow. This is holy ground. Why? Because Christ was in the bush. Can you say amen? Okay. But the bush was not consumed. Well, wait a minute. Every fire I've ever started would consume a bush. Now, either this is a real literal fire that miraculously did not consume the bush because of Christ, which I'm not ruling out. More likely, I believe, it is because the appearance of God. We know this from Ezekiel and other places. The appearance of God, Daniel says it as well, is like a fire. We cannot describe human, human I put it, I read the really good blog on this once. Human uh, language is woefully inadequate to describe the appearance of God. Can we agree? Okay. So it is like a fire. That's the best we can do to describe it. We know, and I'm making a point here, we know that the uh, Aaron's sons, okay, they took strange fire. Ellen White makes it kind of clear they were probably drunk, okay, when they went into the most holy place. It says, fire came out and consumed them. Well, what kind of fire was that? I would say it's the presence of God, not a fire of combustion. Why? Because you re read on. That's how you can understand the Bible better. If you don't understand something, read on. <laughs> okay? Read on. Read it as a whole. Okay? We know that this, this, had, this could not be in a fire of combustion. Because several verses later, it says they carried them out by their tunics. Now, if you've got something hot enough to consume someone, like an incinerator, you're pretty much going to incinerate the clothes, don't you think? Okay. Yeah. Oh, where is the mic? Yeah, you got one right behind, right there. Oh, yes, thank you, Chris. Huh? Okay. We're talking about the consuming fire description of presence of God. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. Abednego. Okay. They were in this fire. Yes. I think that fire is something where you describe as it not being something that we can comprehend and we can't imagine what God is other than love. Right. That fire that saved them was pure love. Right. So this element of God the creator to try to comprehend in regards to that I, I, I would have to say it's ever creating God's ever creating always creating right yeah and, and you know this is love is that fire that's what I you know what because if it wasn't for that love Jesus wouldn't have died on the cross for us 
you know, let's come right back to. I you know? love what you said there. We're going to come right back to that. I do want to say, I, I do want to okay. say one thing. The fire that, can, that that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into that was a fire of combustion. There was a backdraft when they opened the doors. There was a backdraft that killed the people instantly that were basically wanting to put forth fuel on the fire. Okay. So God miraculously saved them from a fire of combustion. All I'm saying is there is the appearance of God appears like a fire, which is not a fire of combustion, but it does consume. And we're going to talk more about that. Are, are we clear on that? Okay. Andy and then Ethel. That fire came awfully close to those, um, we'll get right to those three um, because it burned the ropes that they had tied around their wrists. Indeed. Burned so, them like wax. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Further evidence of what we're talking about. Very good. Okay, so Rich and then, then Andy. Yeah. Thank you. Might one propose that the fire that killed the two guys in the temple the fire came from within. Didn't come from without. So that's how God chose to deal with this so they could be carried out by their tunics. Right. But let's take one more step in looking at fire. What happens when you burn something? You ever stood there and watched the fire at the fire at the at the campsite and you're seeing that wood burn? What do you see going on? Is it lay is the wood just laying there and then the fire burns and it just kinda goes away? No. Fire is violent. Mm -hmm. It causes things to pop and and move and curl and do all of this sort of thing. Burn, melt. Yeah. And so when we are cleansed by the fire that God is cleansing us with, let's start thinking about the trials and challenges we have in our life that are akin to this fire. Right. It's not a peaceable, I can tell you, it's not a peaceable thing. No. No, it is not. Thank you for that, because we're building up to something here, and I love that. That's a really good puzzle piece there. Andy. Rich has a good point there about that fire within. I've never thought about that. That's, that's an excellent point. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, these fires that we're talking about, you know, the ones that uh, the three Hebrews um, uh, experienced, I believe that this... Um, um, uh, I have a theory. Uh, it, it, it's kind of in depth, but so I won't go into it. But I have a theory that unless that fire was seven times hotter, that the three Hebrews would not have survived. It had to be hotter than normal fire. See, that's normal fire, so it was increased seven times, right? Right. And so, and then that burned off bondage. Then the uh, uh, Aaron's sons. The, the, the bondage they, uh, was still on their body as they were carrying them out. The, you know, this, yeah. uh, you know, the tunics, that's, that, that bondage was still there. Interesting. And, yes, mm. and, and so, you know, you kind of put all this together, and it's uh, uh, really where you can just uh, put some extra thought into that and, and really think about, you know, uh, this fire and and um, you know and then uh, uh, th there's all kinds of things that roll through my mind when when Jesus was uh, um, being arrested in the garden and the and the angel flew by right. and and all the men went dead right well you know uh, well who didn't go dead well Jesus didn't right well who else didn't the disciples didn't right you know it was interesting uh, that. Uh, who 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 fell down as dead men? Yeah, you know, and so you know th this this uh, this fire and this and this uh, last fire when I believe when um, uh, when God will do His strange act, I believe this is a a fire of affection. He loves these ones so much that he will that he will 
want to hug them because he knows that this will be the last time that he will have with these uh, ones that didn't choose him because right. remember jesus died for all you right know? so so anyway just uh, i i know this is a, just a jumbled up mess of comments but uh you know it uh, uh just a lots of thoughts that i've thought about this um these fires you know these right. uh, these types of fires right and i love what you did there we'll get right back to you i love what you did there because i've I've been thinking a lot along the lines of hellfire and what is it that consumes the wicked and all that kind of stuff. I'm not, to say, I'm not saying there's not a fire of combustion that turns everything to ashes. The Bible seems kind of clear about that. But Rich brought up something that the fire came from within. Remember, in Ezekiel 28, Isaiah 14, it's one of those two. Speaking of Lucifer, it says, I will bring fire from your midst. It will consume you. Well, wait a minute. I thought there was a fire. I thought there was flames of combustion that did. It's not what Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14 say. From the midst of well, that's interesting. Now, we don't want to get too far off onto hellfire. We get, we, get, we get off track. What I do want to leave in your minds as we're discussing here, there are two radically different types of fire. There is a fire of combustion sitting around this campfire. Great stuff to talk about. There is also a fire that is God's presence. Remember, at the second coming, people will be pray the wicked will be praying for the rocks to fall on them because they cannot take the light. Does that make sense? Yep. What do you think that's going to be when Christ totally unveiled? They fell as if dead men. What do you think it's going to be when he is totally unveiled for the first time ever? Ellen White says that if we had to suffer the consequences of all of our sins it would crush us is what she says that's interesting glennis and then rich so talking about the appearance of god like a fire well we can see in poetry and in pieces of writing how my love will engulf you or my love it may, it's warm makes you feel safe God engulfs us with his love by surrounding us with it. And I had more thought, but I just blanked on it. But that was the main point, that his love engulfs us like a fire. And the and there's tough love, too. And I've experienced that as a daughter, we're needing to receive some stern language from my parents because... I love you, Glennis, but this is, it hurts both of us. But because I love you, I'm saying this, or I'm telling you that this needs to change, or this needs to be removed, because you'll be better off if you don't do this, or engage in this thing anymore. And that's how God is with us, is I love you very much, and I want what's best for you, but this needs to go. And only with me here, I can help you get rid of that, even if it hurts. Right. And we're going to get right back to that. We're laying really good groundwork here. We're doing pretty well on time, too. Rich, what do you got? I would like to add to the accumulation that he's started to build back here. And that is a thought about fire. Perhaps... Um, the fire of God, or God is fire, is such an environment that standard type fire cannot penetrate that type of fire or environment. And those uh, Hebrew guys were in that divine fire as opposed to man type fire. Just a thought stacked on whatever else he had and, and that's good great stuff to think about there really good Paul the Apostle Paul and we'll shift gears here the Apostle Paul and if I had my notes on me I'd draw you right to it I'm pretty sure it's in 1st Corinthians remember where he's talking about that 
you know, the refiner's fire, he's talking about the gold, silver, precious stones. But in that, there's also hay, dross, and whatever. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Great text Paul has there. Ellen White, in Prophets and Kings, page 410, says that this gold, silver, and precious stones, she identifies it point blank. Faith, obedience, and good works. But let's be very clear, because Troy hit on it. None of this comes without Jesus. Remember, through him I can do all things, but apart from him I can do how much? Nothing. That's right. Nothing. The Bible's pretty clear on that. Without Jesus, I can do nothing. So this whole good works, this is not an argument of salvation by faith versus salvation by works. You guys know me. It is salvation by relationship with Jesus Christ based on love and trust. In it, we will be transformed so we can be Christ-like and be welcome at the family reunion. Can we say amen? amen. Okay. Because if I'm not transformed, I'm not going to be welcome at the family reunion because I'll be disruptive there. And, and you don't have to take my word for it. You don't even have to take Ellen White's word for it. Or Rich's either. I'm going to pick on Rich. Okay. Well, you don't. Right? The Apostle Paul said it point blank. He said, neither fornicators, adulterers, manipulators, blah, 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 will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, he says. But you have been washed. You have been sanctified. You have been justified by the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. What does the word washed mean? Cleansed. Cleansed. Okay. Cleansed. And we know that, this is, yeah, this isn't just a word in English, okay? Let me illustrate. Let me illustrate. Rich, you and I, we're going to go out and we're going to work in the field and we're going to get some stuff done and whatever. We're going to be hot and sweaty and whatever else. And then we're going to go out on a double date with your lovely wife and, and my lovely girlfriend, Kehlani. But we don't have time to change and we don't have to, well, we might have time to change our clothes. Yeah, we got time to change our clothes. We don't have time to go shower and everything. But you think they're going to be happy with us when we go out? Why not? We look fine. Don't smell so good. You've got to wash. <laughs> okay? and, and God does the washing. Amen? God's very clear. God does the washing. Okay? Puts the robe on us and so forth. All right? Now we're ready to go out on that double date. That make sense? Washing. You've been washed. You have been sanctified. Okay, sanctified, big word, it means set apart for holy use, period. That's what it means. We can make a lot out of that, but that's the bottom line. Justified. Justified is another big word that we make a whole lot out of. But I'm going to keep it, yeah, set right and sanctified could be said kept right. So set right, kept right. Okay, how many of you use, and I've used this illustration before because it's, boy, you can wrap your head around it. How many of you use a word processor of any kind? And no, this is a word processor. Like Microsoft Word or WordPerfect. And no, this is not an argument of who has the best word processor. We're not, we're, we don't have time for all that. Okay. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Jesus has the best word processor. Amen. I love what you said there. Well, word processor, when you left justify or center justify or whatever, what are you doing? You're setting it to print within certain parameters on the page. I will propose that to be justified by the Lord Jesus Christ is you are allowing him to set the parameters for your life. That make sense? Yeah. Okay. Which brings us back to this, this burning off of the straw, the stubble, the things that you don't need in your life. Glennis, you pointed it out very well yourself. The things that, yeah, Glennis, yeah, it's not the best for you. That's part of that dross. Let's get rid of that. Yeah. So now we get through the refining fire. We go through this process. You got the mic there? Uh, they, they make me. Okay, so now we go through this refining process. Yeah. Okay. So now it's about preparation. Yes, sir. Okay. So in order to get to that process of living accordingly to what Jesus wants us to do going through these crucibles going through this fire this preparation that is to 
take place that we need to do mm -hmm. is pretty important in regards to being able to do his will, live accordingly to you know the word, and uh, then we go to Jesus' last words. I just wanted to go over to that because of what we were talking about, the fire. Yeah, please. You know, now, I mean, we got to, we got to start the preparation, you know, being examples, mm -hmm. you know. And I think that's the biggest part of just this church family, unity. You know. Who are we individually? Do we do what we need to is in regards to be a servant of God, to serve, not just our own crucibles, but everyone else's crucibles. Right. Right? That's right. That's a big part of it. Right. You know? So I'm thankful that there are people who are not just willing to listen and learn and witness, but those that are willing to reach out and help. Absolutely, and we need to do that. You know, you touched on a couple things there I love. Is Remember the Apostle Paul. He said, I die, how often? Daily. Daily, he said. I die daily. You know, Martin Luther, kind of interesting. Martin Luther, he would spend an hour in prayer every morning. Unless he was going to have a very difficult day, in which case then he would send, spend more, okay? We know the Apostle Paul said, one other thing Troy touched on, the Apostle Paul said, imitate me. Who imitates Christ? In other words, imitate Christ. There's an idea. Absolutely. Character. character. This is all about character. We'll get right back to that. Yes, Ethel. Um, it just occurred to me um, in talking about the the Hebrew children in the fiery furnace. And yes, those bonds, and remember they are bonds. That's why they were tied, they were thrown in there. And the dross in that was the bonds and they were burned. And so with the refining uh, that's going on, what we're losing is the bonds that's holding us here instead of holding us with Christ. Amen. Amen. And you know, while you were talking, great comment, Ethel. Thank you. Yeah, Remember the, awesome. you're right. Remember the, and, and let me say one other thing too as we're putting this in the mix and then we'll shift gears here. Hebrews is very clear. Apostle Paul in Hebrews is very clear. He said, now let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Now remember, there's two different things here. I used to love diagramming sentences when I was in fifth grade or whatever. I, don't look at me like that. I was a dork. I admit I was a dork. Okay. <laughs> okay. You know, and here's the thing. There's two different things there. The weight and the sin. Is the weight, is the weight sin? Yes. Not by that definition. Oh, okay. well, Paul delineated the two. But the point is, is there things in our lives that even though they're not sin per se, they're weighing us down from running that race? Amen. That's all I'm saying. I, and I'm not going to define it for you. That's your problem. <laughs> okay. I've got my own problem, you understand. Right? I've got to work that out with God myself as to what's a weight weighing me down and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Your weight's different than mine. Is, is that, are we clear? I can tell I've poked the bear. Go ahead. Yeah. What, what do you got there, buddy? <laughs> well, you think about it. And the thing that, that weighs people down and stresses them out is um, guilt. Right. Now, guilt, I would propose, is self-imposed because we don't have to have guilt. Right. We can choose not to have guilt because in, in, um, in writing, in reading uh, scripture and uh, pen of inspiration writings, 
We find that guilt is Satan's tool mm -hmm. to drag us down and direct, redirect our thought process mm -hmm. and then controls us in that process. So we cannot submit to the Holy Spirit, who then, of course, as you so aptly pointed out at the beginning, it is the focus of God in dealing with his humankind to bring them back to pre-fall condition. Amen. Amen. And on that, boy, wow, wow, that's exactly where I want to go. Guilt's an interesting thing, okay? Where in the Bible does it say that we are supposed to ruminate over our sins all day long? Where does it say that? No, that's God. That's Satan's plan. Okay, because he knows that every time we ruminate over it, that actually makes us worse. Okay, psychological studies have been done on that. We don't have time for all that. Very, very interesting. No, it says you're supposed to confess it, give it up to God, move on. Amen? Amen. Okay, the man at the pool of Bethesda. We'll get right to you, Glenn. The man at the pool of Bethesda, he'd laid that in that condition for 38 years years and when Christ came to him says would you like to be made well what a ridiculous question I used to think but no no that's an actually very good question but what did the man do well I've been this and well I've been that and blah 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 and yeah, yeah, yeah. I can just see Christ say yeah I didn't ask all that I ask you one question he did it in love you understand but I ask you one question would you like to be made well? That's a yes, no question. Amen. Yes, no question. And I believe he's asking each and every one of us that same question. Would you, you, you like to be made well? It's yes or no. Go ahead. When you commented on dross and all the weighted stuff, it made me think that each kind of metal or even um, batches of the same metal, they're unique. And they have their own impurities, different amounts, some more than others, some less than others. What may be a weight for one person may not necessarily be an issue for someone else in relation to something could be a sin, or I mean, not necessarily a sin, but given their, that person's life experience, it very well could be. It's like, Lord, this is hampering me and this is making me ineffective, so please make this go away and help me to stay away from it. And then, as you mentioned about um, reminiscing on our sins, the only, he wants us to remember it so that we can confess it, and depending on what we've done, he'll allow the consequences to play out, so it's like we understand how bad it is and that way we can avoid and tell others, don't do what I've done because I don't want you to experience that suffering like I put myself through. Right. Thank you for that. You know, it, it amazes me. Well, we'll get Ethel and then I'll address that. Thank you so much for that, Glennis. In answer to her, um, it's like this. If we ask God to forgive us of our sins and we believe that he actually did. Right. Are we going to keep, keep reminding him of it? Jesus, I did this, I did this, I did this. Instead of believing that he actually did. Absolutely. That's a very good point, Ethel. I'm going to ask you one, though. Very good, very good. Is he going to remind us? No. Okay. No. Yes, ma'am. Okay. How many of you know, I'm making a point here, heard this illustration the other day. I'm like, what? <laughs> it's like, this is a good one. How many of you know a person that has forgiven you, but oh my goodness, they won't let you forget it. In fact, they would, well, you remember I forgave you for such and such. Yeah. How much of a, how much of a fun is it to be around that person? Huh? See, being with God for eternity is going to be a genuine pleasure. 
because Jesus ain't going to be bringing it up. Know what I'm saying? He's not going to be saying, yeah, I forgave you, but just remember that. That's not how it works. That's not how it works. <laughs> no thanks. <laughs> That's not how it works. God doesn't have amnesia, okay? He doesn't. But he's not going to bring it up, okay? Boy, we could talk a lot about that too, but we need to move on. Rich, you mentioned something. You mentioned something earlier. Thank you, Glennis. You mentioned something earlier. To bring us back to pre fall conditions, if I heard you correctly. Absolutely. So let's talk for a moment about what was the pre fall conditions. What does that mean? We were made in the image of God, it says. What does that mean? Yeah. To give us a base. We're all over the map. In response to that. I refer you to the book of Romans where Paul says sin is an attitude of rebellion against the principles of heaven. Righteousness is an attitude. So we're talking attitude here. Right. Plug that in to what you just asked. Right. It's an attitude issue. Mm -hmm. We are going to have a righteous attitude. Mm -hmm. We're not going to be rebellious. We're not going to be down in the mouth about anything God has going. Right. We're going to be supporting him. We're going to be talking about him, we're told. We're going to be explaining to other beings of other worlds in these little conferences we're going to have around the universe what God did for me. Right. Right. And how great and gracious is God. Mm -hmm. Our attitude will be melded, if you please, with the attitude of Christ. Yes. It's, a, it's an attitude of righteousness. Right. Absolutely. A Oh, I love how you said that. Righteousness is an attitude. Okay. Sin. Let's define sin. Okay. Sin, I would say in short, is rebellion against God. Okay. You guys know that the text, King James Version, King James Version says, you know, sin is transgression of the law. Okay. But I like how New King James defines that a little bit better. Sin is lawlessness. And if you read the Amplified Version, oh my goodness, okay? I've used this illustration before, I'll use it again. When I, when I got my, my 2010 Cobalt, this is years back, and no, it's not a Cadillac or any such thing, but I used to drive a 1993 Geostorm, and, and, and that was a car that if you were doing 65 miles an hour, you knew you were doing 65 miles an hour, okay? It's very clear. <laughs> this is back at the site, going out to the site when it was still 65, well, I got this, I got the cobalt, and I'm driving out there, a friend of mine, we're just chatting along, tootling on. I look down, I'm doing 80. Holy cow. So I slowed down, set the cruise control of 65, so I don't get a ticket, you understand. All right? Was I breaking the law? Yes. Was I intending to? No. And when I recognized my plight, what did I do? I took corrective actions to get within those parameters. Okay. My point is this. Smoking abandoned. Now that's lawlessness. Okay. You see what I'm saying here? Okay. It, sin is a condition of the heart and the mind. It is rebellion against God. It is an attitude. So if sin is rebellion against, the, against God, then righteousness must be, I don't know, in harmony with God. As in, not in rebellion against God, which is also an attitude. Absolutely. Are we clear on that? Once in a while, I've got to define some terms, okay, but we try to keep them simple and make sure we understand. Wait a minute, what do these big words mean? Ellen White was once approached by this little girl. 
I love this story. And she said, and this little girl came to her and says, are you going to be preaching today? And Ellen White says, no, 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 I'm not going to be speaking today. And uh, she says, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. I brought my friend because I wanted her to hear. Can you please tell the pastor not to use these big words like sanctification and justification? We don't know what these words mean. That's why we try to keep it simple. <laughs> okay. Set right, kept right. Does that make sense? Okay, so we were made in the image of God. Through the fall, we are not in that same condition. You have a thought? Oh, I thought you raised your hand. Oh, okay, very good. So, so this whole thing, this whole thing is to get us back into relationship with God. Does that make sense? Yeah, there's... Did you have a thought? You know, I think in regards to this, you know, we're talking about character building and being able to be with God and do what's right. Yeah. And do His will and be an example. Uh, we have a lot of people in this world, outside these doors, wherever it is, family members, friends, who are in crisis that need a path, a direction, and know what hope is. Hope, you right. know? And uh, there's a lot of information, and people aren't aware. And so being able to give this truth to those individuals, be it loved ones or friends, you know, having to do, be able to do it in the right way. Right. This message. And like you, keeping things simple. Exactly. Okay. That's a key thing. It is. Because you can get them lost, and they're like, okay, I'm not going to church, you know. I, I, I love you. I like you. You know, you're a God-fearing person. You go to church every week. But I get lost in the things that you're trying to say, you know, that they lose hope. Right. So we've got to be really careful in regards to trying to win souls. Yeah, absolutely. Because I think that's our job. Absolutely. You know, if we're going to be Christ-like and examples... You know, we need to reach out in a specific way, a certain way, mm -hmm. where we can bring these individuals, sinners just like us, right? brothers, sisters, you name it, friends and everyone, you know, earth children, God's children, right? you know, to the importance of salvation and this Absolutely. message of hope, you know, because I speak to people all the time in regards to these, these crises, these situations that are occurring the time that we live in. Right. By expenses, money, these, you know, the inflation, this and this and this. and That's got people's running, attention. You know what? Yeah, people are tired of being lied to. You know, uh -huh. we're talking about the devil, Satan, his deceptions, emotions. Right. How discouraging. He plays on everybody's emotions, mm -hmm. you know. And the next thing, anxiety and fear and all these things that are taking place right now. How are we as Christians... God fearing people, Christ like examples, trying to not only purify and cleanse and walk in the fires and trials that are going on in our lives, but being able to help those that are looking for the truth and the answers, to, you know, in the right way. Indeed. And I tell you what, it's hard and difficult to be able to explain, you know, how to just relax, stay calm, pray, you know go talk to a pastor or come to the church or I got this book, I got this or something that might be able to help lead you to, you know, uh, a, a better direction, you know, because they're so tired of just this world that has just, you know, become so overwhelming, you know, and it's becoming, it's not going to get any easier. It's not going to get any better. It's not. No, it's going to get tougher, you know. And people are just losing hope. Right. You know, I got family members that are just calling me, and, and there's just wonderful, hardworking individuals wanting to do what's right, honest, truthful, but they're running into all these barriers and just mm -hmm. all these other things that are taking place that are just like, ah, oh, what do I do? What do I do? You know, and it's right. like, you know, try to give the right answer. And uh, I think it's not just church members, but followers of Christ, in these times that we live in, you know, even Ellen G. White says, you know, you've got to be able to bring the light. Right. 
you know, and so we can win souls. Right. Not lose those souls. We want everyone to be able to be in the kingdom of heaven to hug and love and 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 Indeed. share in the experience of our Savior and and uh, so I mean these trying times, these crucibles, and our character in the community and just what we're trying to do by saving souls is, I think the the, the biggest part of what we need to be doing. Yeah, you know it, and. Uh, I'm looking for answers all the time. I don't have them all. I, you know, and I'm reading and just trying to right. find the help and the hope by giving people, you know, something to encourage them and not discourage them. Right. So, you know, when anybody well, and everybody note, says our experiences, you know, to share is just like, um, you know, being calm and listening and, and uh, not saying anything that might you know, take them in the wrong direction. Exactly. And I think, you know, being open-minded and loving and having that compassion and empathy is, is just so important. It is. Nowadays. It is. And two notes be, on uh, that. Two uh, notes on that. One, you mentioned Ellen White there. She comes up quite frequently. Yeah. Not... Not to supersede or supplant or anything else the Bible. Not at all, but to help us better understand it. Amen? Amen. Okay. I love what she said. Christ methods alone will win souls, essentially. So it, you need to follow Christ's example in everything. Okay. What did Apostle Paul say but that very thing? Basically, follow, follow Christ in everything. Duh. I mean, that makes sense because it's all about Jesus. Amen? Amen? Always has been, always will be. And when you look at the great controversy, that's what it's all about. It's about the character of Jesus. And for our little world, see, too often we want to think about salvation as just about me and what Christ is just about me. Okay? That's level one through four law thinking. Okay? But we've, I heard this one the other day. It's real good. We've got, to, we've, got to, we've got to grow up. We've got to not be the kids in the sandbox. We've got to, or the kids in the playpen. We've got to understand, guess what? There's a lot more playpens out there. Okay? Not only on this planet, but there's other playpens. That Ellen White's very clear. The atonement was for them as well. Well, wait a minute. How could that be if they had never sinned? It's because they still had questions that needed answering. And Christ's life, death, and resurrection answered those questions for the universe. Are we clear on that? Yeah. When you grasp that level, oh, things start making a lot more sense. Okay? Everything makes more sense. Yeah? Go to uh, Friday, discussion questions. It's sort of exactly what you're talking about right now. Yeah. We're like about two minutes. Yeah, neither am I. So. Yeah, well, and it is. It is. In yeah. the time, in the minute or two we have left, I did want to say two things. One is, yeah, Christ methods alone. And then also, when you're winning people, it is a law that we become like the God we worship or shall I say God or gods uppercase G a lot of lowercase G's know what I'm saying okay if you focus on the world you will become more worldly that's a fact if you focus on God meaning Jesus Christ in his word spend time in prayer meditating contemplating on these things Ellen White made it very clear so clear you know, if we spent, it would do well to spend a thoughtful hour every day contemplating the life of Christ, especially the closing moments, and in it you will be transformed. You can't help but be. You just can't help it. Because, not because God's forcing, not at all. Because this is a fundamental law. It's like gravity. That's how it works. Modern psychology would say that as well. 
They finally caught up. Amen, Andy? <laughs> you know? That's awesome. That's how it works. Do you have just a final oh, we, thought? Oh, we just got to gotta stand firm, you know, because the Satan's working really hard. Okay? He's there, and he ain't got much time left. Amen. Okay? So he's going to do anything and everything possible to distract us. Dis That's right. Discourage us. That's right. He's going to play on our emotions in every part of our actions or where it is we go, what we say, what we do, what we think, what we eat. Right. I mean, he's going to, I mean, just throw anything and everything at us. The right. crucibles, these fire, you know. Right. So we as Christians, like it says here in Thursday's study talk about the important role of the community in the life of a Christian. How well does your local church function as the body of Christ? How well do you represent the Lord as a community, you know, as a class? Talk about what you can do to improve. Right. And how well do I do that? Right. You know, we're our own worst enemy. We are indeed. A Christian, ourselves. We are indeed. So we have to really walk in the light, look to Christ. You know, like Ellen G. White says, just study and, and yeah. give that reverence and obedience that he desires that we need to, you know, put forth. To make sure that, you know, the Holy Spirit is guiding us. Amen. So, you know, without that Holy Spirit, it's, the struggle is even harder, you know. Mm -hmm. And I just, I pray all the time that I can lead more of my family and friends. Right. To just the truth in this time, you know. I mean, it's just the time, the, mm -hmm. the era that we live in right now, it's just, it, we're moving fast. I right. mean, you know, people are last. Is this, you know, this... Uh, Ellen G. White says, you know, what the great changes are soon to take place and the movements will be rapid ones. Right. Are we in that time? Are these the rapid movements? Or are we getting close and this and that? And people are asking me, and I'm saying, well, the best thing we can do right now is to get prepared. Right. We have to get prepared, you know? Because <laughs> right. if we're not prepared, you know, we're, we're not going to be ready. Absolutely. And we're so, out of time here. Yeah. Thank but you. Anyway, for thank that. you. I yeah, you bet. Thank you. Well, we could do that for hours. Great discussion. <laughs> Appreciate all your thoughts. But it is, once again, it's all about Jesus. Amen. It's about following Jesus wherever he leads. Amen? Amen. Let's, say, let's say a closing word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you once again for this time we've had. Wonderful discussion. Lord, we want to thank you and praise you for your Holy Spirit being here with us and guiding us. Lord, help us to assimilate what we have learned. Help us to focus on you not only for ourselves, that we can be more like you, but that by following your methods alone, we can win others to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Good job. <laughs> That's easy to do.
Good morning. Welcome to the Idaho Falls Seventh-day Adventist Church, and those of you that are joining us online, welcome to you as well. We have just a few announcements. By just a few, I mean quite a few. Uh, we do have a fellowship meal after the service today. Feel, feel free to come join us for that. We're having a, an oriental theme. Uh, August 6th, I believe, is that next Sabbath? At Marshall and Lorraine's, they're going to have a picnic lunch at, at their house. So feel free to bring, is that two Sabbaths from now? Two Sabbaths from now. Bring your own picnic lunch and some community outreach ideas. Uh, we have tentatively planned a yard sale for August 19th. So let Lorraine know if you are wanting to participate in that in some way. That's not tentative, that's confirmed. That's confirmed, it is the 19th. Uh, the Eastern Idaho State Fair starts September 2nd, runs through the 10th. Uh, so I, I noticed Verna running around this morning confirming um, who's going to fill what slots. If you had committed to filling a slot and you haven't talked to Verna yet, please do. Or if you think you'd like, if, if you hadn't committed to a slot and still wanted to come help out, I'm sure there's room for some more help. Uh, we have the Idaho Conference Women's re Retreat, September 9th through 11th. I'll talk to Lynette if you have any questions about that. Uh, we have a Facebook page now, so if you're interested. If you get on Facebook, go ahead and search for Idaho Falls Seventh-day Adventist Church. We have a women's Bible study. Those are Tuesdays at 4 p.m. If you're interested, you can talk to Lynette or Lorraine about those. And our normal prayer meetings are Mondays at 7 p.m. via telephone. There's a phone number and a pin in your bulletin. And... You've got a few flyers in your bulletin. Most of them were covered in the announcements. The one that wasn't, uh, Pastor Peter Simpson and his wife will be here the weekend of August 13th so we can get to know them and they can get to know us. So please make it a, a point to attend that Sabbath and get to know them before, we, before a final decision is made on whether or not they're going to be our new pastors. Our call to worship this morning is in the hymnal number 761, Righteousness Not By Faith. I'll give you a moment to get there. As always, I'll read the light print, and you read the dark print with me. Number 761. Righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement. Through faith in his blood, he did this to demonstrate his justice, because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time, so as to be just and the one who justifies the man who has faith in Jesus. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, 
who has become for us wisdom from God, that is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. All right, please stand with me and let's sing hymn number 330, Take My Life and Let It Be. Loving and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this Sabbath day that you have blessed us with. We thank you for this church, dear Lord, this world church that you have blessed us with. Bless us uh, with your spirit, dear Lord, as we worship thee uh, this day that we may have our eyes steadily affixed upon thee, we ask in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Today's scripture is Galatians 5, verse 5. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. Please be seated. Okay, today's tithes and offerings are for conference advance. Yeah. I'm just going to read a little bit here. 1 Corinthians 13.3 says, If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. We cheerfully worship with our resources because of the love that God has manifested to us. Our attitude while we serve, obey, and worship is important to the Lord. The book of Revelation gives us an interesting example. In the letter to the church in Ephesus, the Lord did not approach this church with any wrongdoing. He even mentioned their good actions. However, one thing was missing. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Without love, obedience is of no value in the eyes of God. In contrast, 
When obedience flows out of love, Jesus has a wonderful promise for us, that your joy may be complete. The story is told of a man who, had a, who was a great provider for his family. Every month on payday, he would purchase everything that his wife and sons needed. The family lacked nothing except of a happy father. Once, one of his sons questioned him, Dad, why did you do all this for us? His answer was, I am legally married to your mother and you are my dependents. It is my responsibility to provide for you. It wasn't the answer the boy was expecting and later in life he understood why the father was so sad when everyone was enjoying the goodies. Obligations and responsibilities had replaced love. How do we give, give to the Lord? Many factors can lead us to participate in tithing and regular offerings, but the Apostle Paul speaks about the acceptable attitude. Each of you should give what you had de decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Our God is looking for cheerful givers, and we grow as cheerful givers when we are motivated by God's love for us. Let us meditate daily on his gift of love and may Christ's love compel us to worship with our resources. This week, as we worship with our tithe and regular offerings, may it be in response to God's extravagant love. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the, the many blessings you give us and the opportunity to give back to accomplish your work. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. has a children's story for us, so if the kids want to go back and get a basket, collect the children's offering, and come listen to Lorraine's story.
morning, kids. How are you this morning? Good. I have a scripture that I'm going to ask Corey. I want you to pay attention because I'm going to ask you if you know what it means, okay? It says, this is from Exodus 20, point, 20 verse 7. Thou shall not take the Lord, name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. What do you think that means? To take God's name in vain. I asked Corey. Let Corey answer, please. Don't say a bad word. Okay, that's one. We don't use God's name in a bad way when people curse. But it also can mean that we shouldn't say that we're a Christian and then act in ways that aren't Christian. So I want you to think about that for a second. And I want you to think about whether or not people pay attention to how you act. Caleb, does mommy pay attention to how you act? How you behave? She doesn't. Oh, I was on the phone with her the other day. I think she actually does. But one particular morning, People were walking down the street in a Midwestern town, and they were walking by a jewelry shop that had a clock in the window. And two gentlemen were walking by, and they looked at the clock, and they said, oh, it's a quarter to nine. We have lots of time before we have to catch our train. And so they stopped, and they visited for a while. And some girls were walking on their way to school, and they looked at the clock, and they thought, oh, we're early. And so they thought of some things to do before they went to school. Everybody that walked by that jewelry shop that morning and looked at that clock ended up late. Do you know why? The clock was wrong. It had stopped working at a quarter to nine, and nobody realized it. They all assumed that what they were looking at was working like it was supposed to be, and that they were where they were supposed to be when they were supposed to be. We're kind of like that clock. If we're not working right, in other words, if we're not behaving good, we're not doing the things that we're supposed to do. People might assume that that's the way somebody who's a Christian is supposed to act. Did you ever think about that? We need to be sure that we know exactly how we're behaving because we don't know who's watching. I thought it was funny when I lived in Basin, Montana. I hadn't gone around town. It's a little town, only about 200 people. I didn't go around town saying, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. But you know what? When a coal porter came through our town and he was down the street at somebody else's house, they asked him who printed the books that he was selling. And he said, oh, they're printed by the Seventh-day Adventist church. And they said, oh, carpenters down the street, they're Adventists. And so when he came to visit me later that evening, he told me that story. And I went, oh, people are paying attention to what I do. And they're going to say, oh, that's how an Adventist acts. And that's how an Adventist treats people. So it's really important because we never know who's watching us. Just like the people walking by the clock, they were sure that clock was right, but the clock was wrong. I don't ever want anybody to think that I am, or that I am a bad example of Jesus. I guess that's the way I want to put it. And I don't want him to think that you are either. So we need to always be cautious and mindful of how we act because we don't know who might be watching. And God is always watching. Would someone like to say our prayer today?
Do you want to do it, Nicole? No? You thought about it. How about you, Caleb? Would you say our prayer for us today? Dear Jesus, thank you for, for a wonderful Sabbath. And thank you for all. And thank you for the things you made. And thank you for everything that they that everything is good. Amen. 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 Thank you, Caleb. You may go back to your seats. Before we talk with God this morning, does anybody have any praises or prayer requests? Yes, um, let's keep Leanna in prayer. Um, that's all I'll say, so she just needs a lot of prayer right now. I have some family in uh, California, an older brother, and some nephews, and uh, they're going through some hard times, trying to understand why things are so difficult and just what they can do. And uh, I just hope that we can all pray for not just my family, but all those who are searching for hope and just pray for them. Thank you. Oh, his name is Monty Whitaker. Mm -hmm. Okay. Those who are able, please kneel with me as we pray. Dear Lord, we come to you this morning as sinners in need of a Savior, and also, Lord, as, as people that, that want to follow you and want to do your work so we can finish the work and, and you can come, come get us. Lord, there were, there were some requests this morning. And we, we thank you that you are a God that hears our requests and answers our prayers in the time and manner that is just perfect. And Lord, we would ask that you would, you would answer even the unspoken requests. And Father, there are so many people in this world that are searching for the truth and trying to figure out what's right, what's wrong, what's going on. We, Lord, and we know, Lord, that you have all the answers. And we ask that you would, you would comfort those people that are sincerely searching. And also that you would use us to, to shine a light to them. And Lord, we've, we've all made mistakes. We humbly ask that you would forgive us of our sins, our transgressions. Please, dear Lord, come soon. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
tell you an amusing story. Well, at least I think it's amusing while I'm tuning. You may remember a while ago, I did something I've never done before. I lost my pick in my guitar while I was playing. Yes, several of you remember that. This morning, I opened my guitar case. I did not have a pick. My pick was sitting on my desk at home. But I was able to shake my guitar and get that pick that I lost a couple weeks ago. I thought that was kind of, kind of, but what's really funny is at least two people have come up and asked me, did you lose your pick again? Because they, they saw me messing with my guitar. What's not funny is I tune this as soon as I get here, I tune it between Sabbath school and church and it still won't stay in tune. Okay, that's all right. Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. Savior. He can move the mountains My God is mighty to save He is mighty to save forever Author of salvation He rose and conquered the grave Jesus conquered the grave So take me as you find me all my fears and failures fill my life again i give my life to follow everything i believe in now i surrender savior he can move the mountains my God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see, we're singing for the glory of the risen King, Jesus Shine your light and let the whole world see We're singing for the glory of the risen King Savior, He can move the mountains My God is mighty to save He is mighty to save forever Author of salvation he rose and conquered the grave Jesus conquered the grave I'm forgiven because you were forsaken I'm accepted you were condemned I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because you died and rose again Amazing love, how can it be That you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true And 
And it's my joy to honor you In all I do I honor you I'm forgiven Because you were forsaken I'm accepted You were condemned I'm alive and well Your spirit is within me Because you died and rose again Amazing love, how can it be That you, my King, would die for me Amazing love, I know it's true And it's my joy to honor you In all I do I honor you Amazing love How can it be That you my king would die for me Amazing love I know it's true it's my joy to honor you in all I do I honor you thank you for singing with me this morning With her children Or in the city Nine to five Each working day She's a mother Or a teacher Or a woman All alone But she's someone else Entirely When she plays She's a Wrestling with powers and principalities Standing in the gap for lovers For her sisters and her brothers Reaching heaven with her heart Where you are you Or that tear she sheds with every whispered prayer We may not see the secret things hidden in her heart But 
the eyes of God are watching her with care. She's a brother down on her knees, wrestling with powers and principalities, standing in the gap for others, for her sisters and her brothers, reaching heaven with her. Satan's strongholds reach in heaven with me. She's a prayer down on her knees, wrestling with powers and Standing in the gap for others, for her sisters and her brothers, reaching heaven with the blood. Oh, you have touched the very heart of God. for that gift of music. We, uh, God has given us a great gift with music. I would like to, uh, um, before I begin my presentation, talk about what we sang this morning in our opening hymn. Uh, hymn number 330. Those of you that don't know the story behind this, this is a uh, woman. Her name is um, Frances Ridley Havergal. And you'll notice that this song was written in 1874, uh, and she passed away at a young age of 1879. But she only wrote four verses, the uh, first two and the last two. About a year before she passed away, she, uh, she had this, what they called a a queen's ransom of gold. She had unbelievable amount of jewelry. And so um, uh, she was a, she wrote many songs. Her, uh, she, her father wrote many more songs. And so uh, in this song, uh, what, what she had done, she had taken all of her jewels and she was so impressed by by what the missions were doing that she gave all of her jewelry away for the for the missions and so and then she thought you know what I'm going to keep this one little this one little bit however in that in that uh, middle uh, verse right at the end there she says not a might I would withhold so she gave away everything for the missions to go around the world. And we praise God for these, what these people have done uh, in furthering the work of God. And thank you again for the gift of music, Holly. That was great. And, you know, uh, uh, this, is a, this prepares the, the heart for the talk. 
but it's actually hard because how can anybody come up here and speak after such a beautiful piece of music? My presentation today is uh, 134 years later. And, uh, and if you do the math, uh, 134 years ago is the year 1888. This is... Uh, uh, a message that I have studied for many, many years, um, and it's dear to my heart, and I hope that uh, some of you understand uh, today uh, the reason for that. And so, um, the year 1888, uh, our church probably had its most important general conference in history. Many, many theologians believe this. And so, uh, um, and so I would like to talk about that today, is uh, what uh, some of the happenings at the 1888 General Conference session in Minneapolis, Minnesota, in November of, of uh, 1888. So, this is, uh, the message that was given there was righteousness by faith, which was the message given in 1888. This, uh, this was also known as Righteousness by Faith. This had many titles. Justification by Faith. The Righteousness of Christ. The Gospel of Christ. The Everlasting Gospel. The Gospel Message. The Third Angel's Message that we are all familiar with, and many others. Here is the church that the uh, 1888 General Conference was uh, held at uh, in Minneapolis at the corner of 4th and Lake Street in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And uh, uh, the street that this is on is on uh, Lake Street. The cross street is, is 4th. And so... Um, I've been to this site two times. Uh, just uh, to, to go there isn't anything spiritually important except for, except for, you know, uh, some what happened there. And so uh, I went to the, uh, also I went to the historical society and uh, I, I wanted to find out about this church and and what happened in October of, uh, and through November of 1888. And so uh, they, uh, very, very nice people, they, uh, they gave me the plans to the church, they gave me all the building permits, they gave me all the write-ups of what was uh, uh, for the church, and they gave me all this material. And, but I wanted to find out about the, the conference. And so there was uh, two newspapers, major newspapers in Minneapolis in that day. Uh, I don't remember the uh, names of them. One of them, the, uh, the uh, religious reporter, went every day, including the ministerial uh, institute that was the week before the general conference, every single day. And then the other reporter, he went about every other day or third day or so. However, one thing that he said that was uh, that really impressed me, he, he had interviews with Ellen White and the other speakers and, and all that, but one thing that he said that, was, uh, that really touched me, he says, these Seventh-day Adventists live their religion. He put this in print. And so, you know, that's a, uh, a real testimony to, uh, to our church that uh, because uh, he kind of alluded that the other churches don't really, uh, you know, they, they live their religion on Sunday. This is that corner today. Um, and so, uh, you know, you can see what happened. It, uh, it has uh, developed more. And uh, that's a dental shop right there. And... Uh, there's some dark history here. Back in uh, about the 1970s, there, uh, there was a, an adult um, entertainment facility here. 
And so uh, I'm sure that God did not want this black eye on this property because of uh, what it, uh, the general conference that had happened that's so important. So uh, he obviously changed this. Now here, back here, you, you can just see a part of the building and uh, it's interesting that there is a, uh, uh, there is a Jesuit school back there. That is, was on the rear part of the property. So, so anyway, it's uh, something how, how uh, things come about and, and, and go forward. This is the only known uh, photograph of this general conference. Uh, and, uh, and you can see uh, all the uh, people there. There were 91 delegates and over 500 visitors that came and went over the, uh, over the general conference session, along with the, uh, the ministerial uh, institute was October 10th through the uh, 16th. And so uh, uh, this was uh, uh, something that was, uh, you know, as the church grew, you know, we had more and more delegates. You know, we just had our uh, general conference here uh, a month or two ago. And, uh, you know, there was, what, 2,700 delegates total. Uh, but so you can really see how the church has really grown. Okay, this is a, a letter that Ellen White wrote to uh, uh, pres uh, General Conference President A. O. Olson in 1895. Um, uh, this uh, uh, is a very lengthy letter. If you uh, and I encourage everybody to to read this. There's parts of it in different books, uh, testimonies to ministers, uh, uh, the 1880 materials, and and different places. But uh, uh, you can see the whole of it in the uh, uh, in those uh, books uh, uh, that have all the letters in them. And this is letter 57, 1895. Take a look at these, uh, at the title, warnings against worldliness, rejecting light, unconverted leaders, and appeal to exalt Christ and proclaim the message of righteousness by faith. Uh, she, Ellen White didn't title this, but all these elements are in, in this letter. And so, uh, beginning with this, as she uh, she says, uh, this isn't the beginning of the total the whole letter, but this is excerpt from it because it is so huge. The Lord, in His great mercy, sent a most precious message to His people through elders Wagoner and Jones. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior, the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. It presented justification through faith in the surety. Look at some of these emphasis words that she has here. Uh, she could have just said in his mercy this, pre this message, but no, she said in his great mercy, God sent this most, this most precious message through, through these two men of uh, Jones and Wagoner. And, it, and this message was to uplift the, the Savior, and, and which is that surety. Amen. It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest, made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. Um, if you really look at this uh, statement right here, isn't this the answer to the sin problem? Many had lost sight of Jesus. They needed to have their eyes directed to his divine person, his merits, and his changeless love for the human family. All power is given into his hands that he may dispense rich gifts unto men, imparting the principle the, excuse me, the priceless gift of his own righteousness to the helpless human agent. These are some solemn warnings in here. Um, I'm one of these. I have lost sight of Jesus myself. And so I needed to have my uh, eyes directed upon him. And that's what this message is all about, is Jesus and having and, and looking to him. Because I am that helpless human agent. 
This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. It is the third angel's message which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and the attend and attended with the outpouring of his spirit in a large measure. Uh, I am just wowed every time I read this. This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world? How come we aren't hearing this more and more throughout, the, uh, throughout our churches? We need to listen to this. We need to proclaim this, this message because this is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. We know the third angel's message and we know that uh, message of Revelation 18 in the first few verses. This is the message that we're supposed to be proclaiming because this is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. The uplifted Savior is to appear in his efficacious work as the Lamb slain, sitting upon the throne to dispense the priceless covenant blessings, the benefits he, is, he died to purchase for every soul who should believe on him. Christ is pleading from the from the heavenly courts above, pleading for those whom he has paid the redemption price of his own life blood. This message of the gospel of the grace was to be given to the church in clear and distinct lines that the world should no longer say, Seventh-day Adventists talk the law of the law, but do not preach or believe in Christ. This is the, the church I grew up in, unfortunately, that uh, uh, I heard a lot about the law, the law, the law. But uh, how much uh, of equal importance was given uh, to Jesus? Not as much as the law, unfortunately. Unless he makes it his life business to behold the uplifted Savior and by faith accept the merits which is with which it is in his own privilege to claim. The sinner could no more be saved than Peter could walk upon the water unless he kept his eyes fixed steadily upon Jesus. It, now, it is, the, it is Satan's determined purpose to eclipse the view of Jesus and lead man to look to man and trust man and be educated to expect uh, help from man. For years, the church has been looking to man and expecting much from man, but not looking to Jesus, whom our hopes and uh, eternal life is centered. Take a look at this. How many times has man been mentioned in this short little paragraph there? That's who we put too much emphasis on. We need to put it on Jesus. Therefore, God gave his servants a testimony that presented the truth as it is in Jesus, which is the third angel's message in clear and distinct lines. This is the testimony that must go throughout the length, the breadth of the world. It presented the law and the gospel binding up the two in a perfect whole. The Lord would have these grand themes studied in our churches. And if every church member shall give entrance to the word of God, I would speak in warning to those who have stood for years resisting light, cherishing the spirit of opposition, how long will you hate and despise the messengers of God's righteousness? God has given them his message to bear the word of the Lord. There is salvation for you, but only through the merits of Jesus Christ. The grace of the Holy Spirit has been offered to you again and again. But there are those who despise the men and the message they bore. They have taunted them with being fanatics, extremists, enthusiasts. Look at this. 
Let me prophesy unto you unless you speedily humble your hearts before God and confess your sins, which are many, you, you will, when it is too late, see that you have been fighting against God. Where she says right here, unless, uh, let me prophesy. She has never said this anywhere else in her writings. Remember, she was a humble prophet. But here, she had a change of tone and and. And, uh, uh, and she was telling the, uh, not just Olson, but the hierarchy of the church, and actually all of us, you know, that uh, uh, her authority as a prophet. Your turning things upside down is known to, to the Lord. Go a little longer as you, as you have gone in rejection of light from heaven, and you are lost. That is a heavy statement right there. I have no smooth message to bear for those who have been so long as false guideposts pointing the wrong way. If you reject Christ's delegated messengers, which were Jones and Wagoner, you reject Christ. There was many others that came on to this, uh, with this message. And so, uh, 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 so uh, the, the messengers grew Neglect the great salvation kept before you for years. Despise the glorious offer of justification through the blood of Christ and sanctification through the cleansing power of the Holy Spirit. And there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. I entreat you to... Uh, I, I entreat you now to humble yourselves and cease your stubborn resistance of light. Praise his holy name. Uh, there is forgiveness with him and you can be converted, transformed. Now let's look at some of the major participants of, the, uh, of this general conference. Elliot Joseph Wagoner was son of pioneer uh, Adventist uh, evangelist uh, J.H. Wagoner. Uh, Elliot E.J. Um, uh, was a, a medical doctor. He got his degree in New York. And um, however, uh, he his heart was not in uh, medicine. His heart was in evangelism. So he quit. Uh, uh, practicing medicine. Uh, he was uh, under uh, John Harvey Kellogg at uh, the Battle Creek Sanitarium, and he went into uh, full-time ministry. In 1883, he became assistant editor of the Signs of the Time, which his father was editor. And then uh, three years later, he and A.T. Jones became editors of the paper. Alonzo Trevor Jones at age 20, he enlisted in the Army for three years and served his country. Seventh-day Adventist publications fell into his hands and, and a Bible and laying a strong foundation of knowledge for his later work as a preacher and a writer. After his discharge in 1873, by the way, he uh, was at Fort Walla Walla, he was baptized and began preaching on the West Coast. In May 1885, he became assistant editor of the Signs of the Times with, uh, his, uh, with uh, Wagoner and became uh, 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 associate editor with, uh, with Wagoner uh, at the Signs of the Times. George Ide Butler. Um, he, his parents were... Uh, uh, close to the uh, beginnings of the Adventist church at age 22 he was baptized by J.N. Andrews and served as president of the general conference for two sep separate terms up to the 1888 general conference however he was unable to make the conference he, uh, uh, he was sick uh, uh, five to six months prior to the uh, general conference so he couldn't make it um, from uh, from here, uh, he uh, um, 
uh, O.A. Olson was elected president. However, he had to uh, continue as president because Olson was out of the country. He was in Europe, and so he couldn't start his term until six months after the uh, 1888 General Conference session. Arias Smith was the Seventh-day Adventist author, minister, educator, and theologian who's best known as the longest-serving uh, uh, editor of the Review and Herald for over 50 years. That is unbelievable. Arias Smith was a versatile guy. He, he uh, uh, had many inventions. He patented an artificial leg with a movable ankle, uh, a school desk, uh, with a folding seat, you know, the school desk today, they, they, you get them, you push it, the seat down. Well, uh, Arias uh, Smith uh, only had one leg. He, his leg was amputated above the, uh, above the knee, so he couldn't get in that desk. So he invented a desk that where the seat comes up from the bottom. And so, what? Yes, yes. And so, uh, but uh, yeah, this uh, Arias Smith was a genius. I've, I saw many of, uh, when I was in Battle Creek, I saw many of his uh, inventions there at the Adventist uh, uh, village. And so uh, really, uh, a really unbelievable inventor this guy was. And then also his, uh, his work, the Daniel and Revelation book. I'm sure that every Adventist has that book in their library. And I have about four myself. Ellen Gould Harmon White, servant of the Lord. Ellen White said, when Brother Wagoner brought out these ideas in Minneapolis, it was the first clear teaching of the subject from any human lips I had heard, excepting the conversations between myself and my husband. I said to myself, it is because God has presented it to me in vision that I see it so clearly. And when another presented it, every fiber of my heart said, Amen. She had some glorious times at this general conference, but she had some terrible times as well. And we'll, and, uh, we'll go on to see. In 1886, Jones and Wagoner, as co-editors of the Signs of the Times in the West, and Smith, uh, the editor of the Review and Herald, and Butler at the GC President in the East, uh, each side began to attack each other's position on the public published articles of the in, uh, in their publications regarding the ten horns and the law in Galatians primarily Galatians uh, 3.24 which was the schoolmaster uh, which uh, the schoolmaster if it was the ceremonial law or the uh, or the uh, moral law um, uh, Jones said that the, that the tenth kingdom was uh, was the Alemanni rather than uh, uh, um, Uriah Smith uh, said it was the Huns. The debate became heated and the lines were drawn between the two sides. In 1887, Ellen White wrote Jones and Wagner to stop writing these articles back and forth and sent Butler and Smith a copy. The warning was for all parties. Um, Jones and Wagner heeded the warning and then uh, Ellen White wrote to uh, Joan, excuse me, Butler and Smith uh, to warn them again and, and, but they did not heed the warnings. You know, I, I forgot to say something. Um, it was interesting. Uh, my mother's uh, funeral, uh, the eulogy, was given by uh, George Butler's uh, great, great, great grandson. And so uh, after her funeral, we had some good conversation about uh, uh, the, his family and, and all of that. Uh, uh, and so, and they understood uh, he was on the wrong side of this. And, and uh, they said uh, they, uh, uh, most of them did not continue in, in their grandfather's uh, thoughts. It was not until 1896 Ellen White said that the schoolmaster of Galatian was both the ceremonial and the moral law. However, mostly 
the moral law. So neither side was was uh, absolutely correct. The law and the the law in Galatians and the ten horns was not the primary message of the 1880 conference. Many people still believe that today, that that was the, uh, what was going on. It wasn't. The principal message of the conference was to be the message of Christ our righteousness. And Ellen White said, in faith I live, uh, I live by, what is justification by faith? It is the work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust and doing for man which it, it is in his, not in his power to do for himself. When men see their own nothingness, they are prepared to be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. Several have written to me inquiring if this message of justification by faith is the third angel's message. I have answered this is the third angel's message in verity. Verity means truth. This is the truth as it is in Jesus. And that's 1 Timothy 2.7. Some brethren have expressed fears that we shall dwell too much upon the subject of justification by faith. But I hope and pray that none will be needlessly alarmed for there is no danger in presenting this doctrine as it is set forth in the scriptures uh, many were uh, afraid of of this message of being of cheap grace however it actually does the opposite when you comprehend who the the uh, who the lawgiver was and and his love then things totally look different. It's not that lawgiver, or I'm sorry, that, that law, but it's the lawgiver that we fall in love with, and we want to keep his commandments. The righteousness of Christ and the entire uh, sacrifice made in behalf of men have uh, been imprinted indelibly on my mind by the Spirit of God, has this subject been presented in the testimonies again and again? When the Lord had given to my brethren, Jones and Wagoner, the burden of, to proclaim this message, I felt inexpressibly grateful to God, for I knew it was the message for this time. See, uh, Ellen White wasn't given the, bur the burden of, uh, of this message. It was given to Jones and Wagoner. And, uh, and so she, she kind of had a, uh, a sideline. She did preach at the 1888 General Conference session, but the uh, most important uh, sermons were given by Jones and Wagoner. And it's interesting, uh, uh, looking at uh, some of the history, that uh, when, when, uh, when Jones and Wagner preached, she just kept on saying, Amen, Amen. When others preached, she, there was times where she got up and walked out the door. The third angel's message is the proclamation of the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The commandments of God have been proclaimed but the faith of Jesus has not been proclaimed by Seventh-day Adventists as equal importance. The law and the gospel going hand in hand. This is the third angel's message. This is the culmination of the third angel's message. Revelation 14, 12. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. And, and uh, we proclaim the law very well. We're experts at it. However, um, the uh, faith of Jesus is not as important, it seems like. And this, this uh, statement right here continues on that subject. This, the faith of Jesus is talked of, but not understood. What constitutes the faith of Jesus that belongs to the third angel's message? Jesus becoming our sin bearer, that he may become our sin pardoning savior. He came to our world and took our sins that, he, that we might take his righteousness. What a gift, isn't it? Here's a solemn warning 
or uh, what happened at that uh, general conference session, an unwillingness to yield up preconceived opinions and to accept this truth lay at the foundation of a large measure, large share of the opposition manifested at Minneapolis against the Lord's message through uh, uh, Brethren Wagoner and Jones. By exciting that opposition, Satan succeeded in shutting away from our people in a great measure the special power of the Holy Spirit that God longed to impart to them, the light that was to be to lighten the whole earth with its glory was resisted and by uh, the action of our own brethren have been in a great degree uh, kept away from the world uh, you know uh, this is this is a sad statement when we see that satan succeeded in shutting away from our church this most precious message and and some of the men followed this this is one of the easiest uh, uh, of, uh, uh, Ellen White uh, quotes it's uh, if you look there's SM selected messages book one two three four five and six super easy to remember if I ever had, have to look it up the thought that righteousness by uh, righteousness of Christ is imputed to us is not uh, to us not because of our own merit on our part but as a free gift from God it is a precious thought the enemy of God and man is not willing that this truth should be clearly presented for he knows that if the people should receive it fully his power will be broken. This is the message that Satan fears the most. If he knows that if this uh, uh, message is given through the church and, and accepted by the church, his time is numbered. He is done. What if they should fall? What about their message? The, many of you know that uh, uh, the history that Jones and Wagoner did fall but what about the message let's see what Ellen White says it is possible that elders Jones and Wagoner may be overthrown by the temptations of the enemy but if they should be this would not prove that they had no message from God or that the work they had done was all a mistake but should this happen how many would take the pos this position and enter into fatal delusion because they are not under the control of the spirit of God we should not be deceived this, the message is from God should the Lord's messengers after, uh, standing manfully after for the truth, for a time, fall under temptation and dishonor him who has given them their work, will that be proof that the message is not true? No, 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 because the Bible is true. Sin on the part of the messenger of God uh, would cause Satan to rejoice, and those who have rejected the messenger and the message would triumph. But if but it would not at all clear the men who are guilty of rejecting the message of truth sent of God. So just a reminder, this message is from God. The, all the Jones and Wagner were just mouthpieces. If you reject Christ's delegated messengers, you reject Christ. That was from that letter to uh, Olson. So how did it turn out? Ellen White said, I have been instructed by God that the terrible experience at Minneapolis Conference was one of the saddest chapters in the history of believers of present truth. This meeting, the Minneapolis Conference, has been the saddest experience of my life. She was publicly defied at that, at that general conference session in person in front of many people they, they, they started saying are you a real prophet wow 
So what's been happening since? The rejection of the message continues. However, this is one of the most studied subjects of a, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And at the meeting of the members of the Ministerial Association Advisory Council held in Des Moines, Iowa in October 22, 1924, it was voted that Elder A.G. Daniels be asked to arrange a compilation of the writings of Ellen White on the subject of justification by faith. Uh, uh, you know, uh, A.G. Daniels was the longest uh, um, uh, general conference president to, to date that we have that we have so far. Taylor G. Bunch was without a doubt correct when he uh, when he said what is known as the 1888. Uh, message of 1888 brought the Advent movement to the very borders of the heavenly kingdom. Sorry, I'm trying to catch up on my notes here. During the 1950 General Conference session in San Francisco, delegates Robert Whelan and Donald Short composed a paper in their hotel room and sent it to the church leaders. The two young men in their late 20s and early 30s authored the 204-page mimeograph manuscript entitled 1888 Reexamined. This book had some quite a history. Um, uh, there was some things going on that uh, uh, that they disagreed in in, in the uh, church, and so they they wrote up uh, this paper. It, it began with a, a short letter, and then they had to clarify, and it turned into 204 pages. Uh, they uh, made copies of this, gave it to the general conference hierarchy. There was 50 copies of this that went through the general conference, and so and and the general conference asked them to to keep this thing under wraps they didn't want it out well the the years following uh, pages started coming out in the Review and Herald, Ministry Magazine, Signs of the Times. It, it, and then they started asking, where did this stuff come from? And so they, they found out who it was come from, and they asked to publish that whole book. And so that took some time after the 1950 to, uh, um, to write, uh, to publish the book. In 19, uh, in, in 19, uh, 88, or actually 1987, the uh, general, um, excuse me, the Ellen White estate um, released all of the 18, the previously um, uh, uh, un, uh, the released documents of the uh, of the 1888 uh, message, and so uh, uh, they they released everything that they had on the 1888 uh, general conference session and you can see here um, I can't see that very well but I think there's 1821 pages there's a lot of material here and uh, this is one of uh, Ellen White's uh, uh, biggest, biggest subjects of, uh, of her writings and uh, there's some very good stuff in, in this uh, in this um, here is a, uh, a short video. Um, uh, this was uh, back in 1984, and uh, there's, uh, this was a, uh, uh, a general, or excuse me, a conference uh, about the 1888 message. And so um, there's the uh, four men up there. The first one that will be speaking is Donald Short. He is uh, this man right here. And then the next one is Robert Whelan. Those are the two that were the authors of the 1888 um, uh, uh, re-examined. And then uh, this is Jack Sequera over here. And, uh, and then the last man to speak, which he, he said he wasn't going to, is uh, Alexander Snayman. Uh, Alexander Snayman was my, was my preacher. I went to uh, this church uh, I began in, in the late uh, 70s. And so um, all of these men, uh, 
had the hope of seeing Jesus come in the clouds of glory. However, uh, unfortunately, they have all passed away. Uh, Jack Sequera, Jack Sequera, uh, he just passed away just three months ago. And so, uh, anyway, uh, by the way, these uh, these four gentlemen had a a, a uh, association to Africa. Um, Whelan and Short were missionaries to Africa. Uh, Short, uh, a little over 40 years. Uh, Whelan, a little under uh, 40 years. Uh, uh, Jack Sequera was born in Kenya, and Alexander Snayman was born in South Africa. She, he was married to uh, a woman named Hankins, and if you know the, uh, the Adventist history, Hankins was a, a prominent uh, family in South Africa. Uh, uh, Hankins was, uh, I.A.J. Hankins was brought out of uh, England to uh, organize the church in South Africa. And, um, uh, and then uh, uh, Hankins was also brought out of South Africa to, uh, 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 for the... Um, uh, uh, the uh, Indiana Conference in the Indiana Conference when they had the Holy Flesh debacle and he was the one that came and fired all of those um, uh, pastors uh, that f followed that, uh, that uh, Holy Flesh movement and so this is a uh, six minute video and, uh, and uh, one thing I like to point out again his name is Donald Short I'd like to uh, ask the uh, brethren that are sitting up there to, to do me a favor and perhaps some of the rest of us out here too. Um, would you mind summarizing for the sake of some who might not have been able to be here up to this point, summarize the 1888 message in terms of what the gospel wants to do, uh, what the gospel can do in the life of an individual in just, you know, a I know that's oversimplification, but I think it would help some to be able to focus this in our minds. All right, it's not an easy question, so I'm <laughs> not making any comments. Uh, perhaps you all three would like to have a part in this. This would be a short answer. <laughs> That same question was asked at Ontario in December. And I stood and said the answer. The 1888 message is to prepare a people for translation. And that's the bottom line. A people who will walk out of this world straight into God's kingdom. These are they who keep the commandments and have the faith of Jesus. That's what this message is all about. Now, the brethren can talk more words. Well, this is a good challenge, and I don't think I've memorized the words, but I would like to recall the first three sentences that Wagoner published in book form following the 1888 conference itself. He quoted Hebrews 3, verse 1, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Then he said, If one will do this intelligently, considering Jesus, looking at him just as he is, that includes the nature of Christ as well, say, this will transform him into a perfect Christian, for by beholding we become changed. Amen. And I think those three sentences sum up the entire 1888 message. There's a high priestly ministry, there's a nature of Christ, there is beholding the Lamb of God intelligently and responding, and the result is perfection, Christ-likeness of character. I'm going to read from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. Now the Lord, that is Jesus Christ, is that Spirit, 
and where the spirit of the Lord is there is liberty but we all with open face beholding as in a glass I think you say glass here <laughs> the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the spirit of the Lord I think that uh, the big question that has to be answered in the great controversy is can God prepare a producer people who love their Savior even more than themselves? Can God expose you to Satan and to the world and say here are my people? You can test them, you can try them, you can persecute them, you can starve them, you can't kill them and see if they will turn their backs to you. And I believe that, that the three angels message, the 18 message was to present to a, our people the matchless charms of our Lord Jesus Christ so that we would be so much in love with him that on the one hand we would have discovered in him the f salvation full and complete so that we are no longer worried about our own destiny we know that in him we stand secure but more than that we are willing to go through anything rather than let him down and I believe that God is going to produce a people in these last days who will say with the Apostle Paul who will say with Moses as he said blot me out from the book of life but forgive them I would that I would be accursed that my people may be saved can God produce a people who are concerned about others more than themselves and I believe that the 18 message has that ingredient in it that can produce it because once you confront Jesus Christ you know you have nothing else left to live for the things of this world become strangely dim and I believe that's the message uh, I believe it gives us peace, it gives us assurance, but it gives us a burden, a burning desire for me to live is Christ. That's how it was eight months to me. You will know when you have assimilated the vital es essence of the 1888 message. And that is when you feel yourself so impelled to take this message to others that you will know no peace as long as you are not doing it. And I believe that this will be its result in your life. There will be the same fiery burning desire to help others to see this truth as there was in the first century disciples when they could not keep silent. We are reminded of the words of the Apostle Paul when he said, Woe is me if I preach not the gospel. Something has to take a hold of you to have that burning constraining of Jesus Christ and I believe that in this message is the vital ingredient that will do exactly that I am glad that uh, that this was preserved all these years there was a, a film company out of Australia that came to the United States to film these uh, these meetings. Um, these were uh, uh, over four or five days. Um, unfortunately, they showed the one lady that was falling asleep. <laughs> but uh, these were very long meetings. Um, and so uh, there's actually some meetings going on in um, uh, at Southern Adventist University about the 1880 message right now. Um, uh, some of the ones that I've gone to, they, they started at 7 a.m. and went until 11 o'clock at night. So these, uh, some of these uh, meetings are very long because there is so much that they want to pack into these uh, meetings. The 1888 Message Study Committee began as a, a small 
a, a group in 1985, this was a year after this v uh, video actually, the object in, was to study and learn about the message of righteousness by faith, which was presented by Jones and Wagoner to the 1888 General Conference session as a small group of people began to study. They realized that this message was deeply interwoven with the gospel, perhaps even the heart of the gospel. I need to give a disclaimer here. I am a board member of this, uh, of this study committee. Uh, I, when I made this presentation, I was not. I've been studying with, these, with this group for many, many years, and, but I believe the message that they are proclaiming, uh, which is Jones and Wagoner, is as true today as it ever was. And so I hope and pray that, uh, that our church will take a hold of this message. And then the primacy of the Gospel Committee. In 1994, the General Conference President Robert Falkenberg appointed the primacy of the Gospel Committee, a group of 11 scholars from Andrews and Loma Linda to meet with six members of the 1888 Mesa Study Committee. Kind of seems unbalanced, doesn't it? Uh, this was an ongoing thing for um, uh, continued twice a year for several years. The purpose was to study the concepts of the message which Jones and Wagoner brought to the Seventh Day Adventist Church uh, from 1888 through the 1890s when Ellen White endorsed them as having heavenly credentials and declared that the message was was most precious in the beginning of the loud cry and latter rain. And then after that, there was the Gospel Study Group, began as an informal follow-up to the primacy of the Gospel Committee, uh, with this background of, was to consider the, the depths of the Bible doctrine of righteousness by faith. It composed of the members of the 1880 Mesa Study Committee and the, and the uh, uh, scholars and theologians from Andrews and, uh, uh, and Loma Linda. When the work of the primacy of the Gospel Committee ended uh, in 2000, it rep uh, the report was issued, and there was some who felt that the work had to be uh, uh, had to go further and more dialogue needed. The first meeting was uh, March of 2001, which was a, uh, about a year after the primacy of the Gospel Committee, and the latest was in uh, in 2019. COVID did some bad things, and unfortunately, this was a victim of it. But uh, uh, these uh, uh, these people came from, some of them from around the world to uh, come to this uh, gospel study group. And this is one of the statements that uh, Ellen, excuse me, that came out of the primacy of the gospel committee. Ellen White recognized that no other church grasped this truth embodied in Daniel 8:14, which is the foundation of our faith. She identified the 1888 message as the third angel's message in verity then, uh, and, and yet the great majority of Seventh-day Adventist members are uninformed in, act, in, uh, in the actual content of the message, uh, of the message and perplexed, perplexed by the confusing views of its history. One interest will prevail. One subject will swallow up every other. Christ, our righteousness. When all these other messages will die away, this message will stand forever. Amen. Now it is time to uh, uh, sing our closing hymn, number 303, Beneath the Cross of Jesus. Um, this, uh, this, the next sentence in our in this is, I, f I feign to take my stand. The feign is an old English word. Maybe we can uh, instead of saying feign, maybe we can say choose. That's what the the uh, modern uh, word today is choose. So how many of us choose to uh, accept Jesus today on the Sabbath day? Amen. the cross of Jesus I choose to take my stand 
the shadow of he rocketh in. loving and gracious heavenly father we thank you for this time that we can come before thee dear lord in your sanctuary on earth bless us that we may look towards that heavenly sanctuary to jesus that uh, we may have our eyes affixed upon him please bless us on this sabbath day as we go from this place that we can uh, uh, learn more of thee and the message that God commanded to be given to the world we ask in Jesus name we pray amen